introduction. Uh, this is Anastasia Wall and I'm here to expand on the uh, topic of fatigue that was uh, presented at the recent education summit for the Rocky Mountain MS. We had such an overwhelming response from that that we felt that to expand on this topic would be very important uh, for persons with MS and for, uh, for people that are interested in understanding MS fatigue. Uh, we hope to talk about what it looks like, how it's defined, uh, what we know about the contributing factors, and also about treatment options. I also wanted to just thank the Rocky Mountain MS Center for their tremendous contribution to the region. Uh, all of my patients benefit from that locally here in Colorado and the surrounding states. Uh, so I just really appreciate this opportunity to get a chance to um, discuss this very important topic. So, thank you. That's very kind, Anastasia. This is Pat. Um, so, we did at the Ed Summit in the spring. We did a panel on fatigue, and there, what was really interesting about the panel was uh, pretty much, I would say, 90% of the audience reported that they had fatigue, and about 85% of the audience said that they had trouble explaining what fatigue was to the people in their lives. So my first question to you, Asia, is what is fatigue and how is it different? Uh, everybody knows what being tired is, but MS fatigue is different than that. One of the things that people with MS fatigue say to me is, I don't understand how I can be fatigued. I didn't do anything. And well, that is true, and that's certainly what we see in clinic as well. Uh, sometimes fatigue can be the first sign of the disease uh, when people go back through their history and they wonder, when did I get MS? That is uh, one of the things that I hear, you know, a lot. Um, I, in research, we know that about 70 to 80 percent of all persons with MS will report fatigue, and most of them uh, talk about the impact. The impact is just tremendous in the lives of individuals in quality of life and in employment. Um, many people retire early, reduce their work hours. Uh, it increases the number of doctor's visits. Uh, and, uh, and, and I just think it's a very important topic. I think it is hard to understand because uh, I, I know that my patients will say, how do I get this to go forward? <laughs> I keep doing this and nothing's happening. Um, so I'm trying to move forward the slide here. Okay, thank you. All right, so, um, you know, so what my patients will say is that, you know, it's just mind-numbing and crushing. It's not the same as being tired because tired goes away. The fatigue doesn't. 
and it strikes you even after you sleep, a full night's sleep. It's not the same thing. Um, it's without mercy in the least. These are, these, are say, these are things that I actually hear in clinic. Also, I would say that, um, uh, you know, oftentimes tired is something that people use commonly. So when a person with MS will say, I'm tired, they might hear, well, me too, I'm tired too. Um, and then I think that promotes a feeling of isolation and thinking, well, I'm not going to really express that anymore because people, it's not very well understood. Uh, so, so I think what you're saying is that MS fatigue is tiredness that isn't remedied by the usual solutions that we have for dealing with tiredness. It's a, a, a more um, intense version of tired. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, when I'm tired, I lay down and I have a rest. Maybe, maybe I got some poor sleep the night before and I might have a little nap. Or maybe I've done a lot, I've gone shopping, I've done a lot with my family and I feel tired and I come home, I watch a movie, but I'm re-energized. I get a good night's sleep the next morning, I wake up, I'm feeling pretty good. That is not the case for persons with MS and the types of fatigue that they get. And, uh, and you know, here's another example. My partner gets it even though she hasn't experienced it herself. That's a relieving thing. So some part, you know, we have many people who, who people in their life do get it, you know, even though they can't experience it themselves. Um, but some don't, and, and I think that because of that, that's, that's one of the features of this fatigue is that feeling like nobody really understands it. When we talk about the uh, definition of fatigue, uh, you know, we talked about a sense of tiredness that's not relieved by rest, um, but also there's this mental fatigue that can be a part of it as well, that people are experiencing, they'll say, you know, it feels like at the end of the day I'm just thinking in mud. I just don't feel like I can even do anything. Uh, you know, they've gotten through the big part of their day. They've given everything at work at, or, you know, for their family or for whatever it is. They're just even getting through their day making meals. And then at the end of the day, they just don't have anything left. Um, so that's, that's some of the things that I think that people will describe. Now, in, uh, yeah, so, so that's kind of the uh, research that we have. Trying to get to this one. Okay. So, fatigue is a symptom of the disease caused by the disease. That's one of the aspects of MS fatigue. Is it's a part of the physical, uh, part of the physical aspect of the disease, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we certainly have seen fatigue in cancer, in viral infections, in lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and you know other immune-mediated diseases or autoimmune diseases. So certainly, uh, this is not the only disease that describes fatigue, uh, but obviously, because I work in MS, this is the one that I'm most interested in. Uh, you know, the benefit of being a PA is that I get to really live on the level of my patients, and then the things that are important to them, I can study even more to try to bring that information to them. So this is, you've just put up on the screen the fatigue severity scale, so this is a way that you can measure fatigue. Can you talk right. about that a little bit? Right. I think the experience of fatigue is, can be overwhelming, it's, it's mercurial, it can change from day to day, not every day is the same. Some days people feel great, some days people are feeling really tired. And so, but in the scientific realm, when we're trying to look clinically, when we're trying to develop ways to assess it, to treat it, we have to create these kind of artificial structures so that we can quantify, so that we can put a number to these things. Um, and one of the ways in which we do this is called the fatigue severity scale. So in the past, I would say, you know, even though fatigue is still poorly understood, uh, understanding has significantly progressed over the last 20 years because of the development of these kinds of scales. It helps, I think, as well, uh, when you ask a question, sometimes it helps to give language to persons and also to help to understand the scope of what we're talking about. So then here, you know, it says, in the last week. So we know that one day does not represent the life. So let's say, and then it's hard to remember. I mean, I don't remember what was going on, well, last week. But uh, so is my motivation lower when I'm fatigued? Do I agree? Do I disagree? Exercise brings it on. I'm easily fatigued. Fatigue interferes with my physical functioning. Uh, frequent problems, 
difficulties to sustain physical functioning. You know, these are the these are the places I think that uh, people can relate to uh, that how it interferes. So it's one thing to be tired, but some people are able to push through that, and it doesn't interfere with their activities of daily living. So when you talk about fatigue as a symptom, is fatigue when people have fatigue as a as a major symptom of their MS? Is it do they have it all the time? Like people have numbness and tingling all the time, or is this something that comes and goes, or is it both? Is it does it come with exacerbations? Does it how does it? Yeah, well, I think I think that is that's a really important question because sometimes relapses can just simply be associated with increases in fatigue. Uh, they, like I said, it can be the first sign of MS even before the diagnosis. It can be a intermittent sign or symptom throughout the course of the disease, and though we look at the MRI and there aren't any changes, it can be variable, it can be constant, uh, and it's very individualized. So obviously we're going to be talking about treatment plans a little later, and so then I think we need, uh, as a clinician, as somebody who wants to be helpful in a person who's suffering this symptom, uh, I think it's important to individualize the plan to whatever it is that the person is experiencing as well as what it is that they hope to get to, you know. So MS fatigue can come from the disease mm -hmm. and it can also come from how you live with the disease, right? Oh yeah, well so there's, there's more than one cause. I, I wish things could be so pure uh, that there could just, we're all living the same life and we're all, you know, that would make research so much easier. <laughs> Uh, but the reality is that there are a lot of factors uh, that play a role in fatigue, um, and, and uh, we can go ahead and switch to those now. Uh, one of the things I just wanted to show, I thought this cartoon really illustrates some of the things that people can experience. You know, that here she, here's this woman waking up in the morning. She's got a good night's sleep. Uh, she's like, okay, I'm going to get out of my bed. I'm going to get dressed. She's ready to go, and now she's done. <laughs> I don't... People say this all the time. Yeah. I get up in the morning, I get dressed, and by the time I get dressed, I want to go back to bed. Yeah. yeah. And some of them do, you know. I mean, some of them are uh, able to get back into bed in, ten, you know, 10 o'clock or, you know, getting up, take medications, and then go back to bed until they start to work or, uh, you know. So it's just, it is very variable. But I just think it's, I thought that this, although this wasn't a cartoon that represented fatigue and MS, when I saw this, I thought, man, this really illustrates what many uh, people do experience. Uh, but to your question about what the uh, primary uh, causes and secondary causes of MS are, uh, yeah, we do know quite a bit about that sort of thing. So uh, the primary causes are talking about what exactly MS is doing in the body. So with immune dysregulation, uh, there are changes in the neuroendocrine function. So, these, so the endocrine system is our, you know, basically chemicals or hormones that are affecting function throughout the body. We know that there are circulating, there's an increase of circulating pro-inflammatory cytokines. So that means uh, they create inflammation and they're chemical mediators. And that they, uh, there are also known to be higher levels of TNF-alpha that are seen in persons with MS. So that's part of the immune dysregulation. Then we move to the central nervous system mechanism. So, so it's not even one thing within the central nervous system. So when you're talking about the all the, the chemicals, mm -hmm. sort of the, uh, an inflammatory soup that you're... Yeah, we okay. think, yeah, we think yeah. so. So if I could just skip down to the other endocrine, so not even uh, just the neuroendocrine. So there's abnormalities in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So this is... Uh-oh. I know. That sounds bad. Yeah, there's really no way to, to, to break this down. This is... This is um, so these are... This is a part of the brain that is... I like to think of it just tasting the blood and just testing to see what what levels of thyroid hormone, what levels of cortisol coming out of the adrenal gl glands, what levels of, so, you know, in pregnancy, lactation, all of those kinds of hormones that are going on. The pituitary gland is, is, is a hypothalamic and pituitary gland are, you know, controlling that. So uh, in MS, these pro-inflammatory cytokines are producing an impairment of that corticoid receptor signaling. So then there's somehow some kind of damage there. So then there may not be the release of the, of the cortisol, uh, and that can create some fatigue. Uh, we have done a, um, however, other studies did not show a correlation. Um, there but, but somehow the, the, the 
part of your brain that regulates all of that mm -hmm. can be damaged by MS, so that's one cause. Right, and, that, and, there, and there may be nothing on the MRI in that area. Okay, so the MRI is a very macroscopic view, meaning it's like looking at your hand in an x-ray. The brain is the most complex structure in the known universe. There's no star or sun or molecule that can compare to the complexity and the, and, the, and the neurons in the brain. So, you know, all the time people are like, how am I changing and my brain MRI is not changing? And I am getting, I am fatiguing. And what I would say is it's because we cannot understand. We don't, there, it's, it's not a lack of wanting to. Um, although, I, if I may just jump over to the MRI, fatigue is not localized to a single area. However, yeah. there have been shown that MRIs with increased atrophy of the gray and white matter, that a higher lesion load, are associated with more uh, fatigue. Um, there's been other studies in progressive MS that has shown uh, decreased levels of DHEA. That's a popular term right now. People are trying to eat more of this brain food, trying to get it more into babies, that sort of thing. Um, and that there may be uh, decreased levels in persons with MS that are associated with an increase of, again, those pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, so there, I think that there are, uh, you know, things that we can't understand. So, so the chemicals, um, or the, the, the chemical environment that's created by MS is one cause of fatigue, but I see on your slide that there's demyelination. Oh yeah, absolutely. So when demyelination, so I think people with MS understand demyelination. It's, there's a, you know, an insulation of the axon and that is stripped in persons with MS. So when that is present, the nerve fibers that conduct nerve impulses um, are altered. And then, uh, and they fatigue rapidly with heavy use in our high body, uh, so they, uh, with body temperatures, so as people increase their temperature, they get an infection, they have um, stress, any, anything that could change it. And they've seen even a half of a, of a um, so, so if it goes from 98.5 to 99, that that can be enough to decrease the conductivity of electricity. You know, these are, these are electrical fibers. So if you think about your computer overheating, that same thing can happen in MS. And then when that happens, it starts to malfunction. Uh, so that's, I think, some of the variability that people are experiencing. So that when they are, you know, tired or they're overheated or they have an infection, they have this, what's almost a pseudo-exacerbation that can, you know, upregulate their... Uh, yeah, we had a, a question that came in that said, um, I'm extremely heat sensitive and even a one degree rise in temperature causes me to become extremely fatigued. So mm -hmm. what you're saying is, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's the way the system works. Absolutely, and I appreciate that question. I appreciate all the questions that have come in. Uh, you know, much of what I've learned about uh, this symptom is because of the patients who are uh, experiencing it. Um, and that's also what um, you know, started my interest in this particular topic. Uh, if, I could, if I could get back to the central nervous system mechanisms, uh, so, so sometimes the neuron is actually transected as a result of the injury. Uh, there's also the inflammation that's going on. I think uh, we know that in functional MRIs when we look at folks and we see how much energy they are having to produce to do the same actions as the person without MS, and we see the area of recruitment is much larger in the person with MS. So they have to recruit more energy to do the same thing. So that's why when people say, oh, but you look so good. You look so good, you know. And, and, and though it's true, we have correlated persons with, who have mobility issues. They seem to have more fatigue. Um, that there are certain things that, that can correlate. But, there are, but these can happen in persons who have none. So I think it's an, I think that that's another important thing to understand when when when, you, when you're suffering with this. So the, the person that's out there listening to me, when you're suffering with this, it's, I think the thing that I want to say is that this is not just in your head. And if you're with a clinician who doesn't understand it, I want you to understand it, and that and that this is a well understood phenomena that is occurring in a mess. And there are reasons for that. It's not just uh, you know in the American. Uh, way, you know, we just need to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. There are definite structural reasons for fatigue. So there are primary factors for fatigue, and so that comes from the MS itself, and mm -hmm. then, then there are secondary factors. So speak to those, would you? Sure. Well, uh, yes. So secondary factors can be, I think, important. So we can't, I think it is very important when we're talking about these structural changes because uh, impact of disease-modifying therapies. 
as you know, our center is very proactive in treating disease progression. We want, uh, if someone is having progression of disease or if they have the type of MS that is affecting them in significant ways, I think it's very important to have a frank discussion about whether or not the current disease modifying therapy is helpful. Uh, there has not been any association that has seen that disease modifying therapies increase fatigue. Uh, so there's only potential benefit because we did talk about those who have more atrophy, more white matter lesions, and then therefore they will have more fatigue. Now these secondary factors, so that is one thing that they can change as far as how to decrease the progression of this disease. Uh, but there are secondary factors that I think they could change today. Uh, that, uh, so let's say they're on maximal therapy. There isn't anywhere up that they can go. Uh, so then what can we do about that? Well. Um, so if I were to be in bed ill for a few days, I, if I got up, I would feel weak. So that's called deconditioning. So uh, strength or loss of strength or weakness is one of the symptoms that I think can cause a sensation of fatigue, uh, but that can be conditioned. So I know that Jeff did a webinar on exercise, and I would, I would refer people who are interested in that topic and how it impacts fatigue uh, to watch that webinar if you haven't already had a chance. So being out of shape is one reason people have fatigue because they get tired more quickly. Correct. Right. So one of the things that you can do is over time increase your general level of fitness so that you don't tire as quickly so then you have less fatigue. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, to the next point, sleep dysfunction. So that's, there's a lot of things that go into that. Obviously, people are having spasms, pain, their bladder is waking them up. Um, uh, depression has um, an impact on sleep, uh, either uh, wanting to sleep too much or not sleeping enough. And, uh, and there can be a vegetative depression as well that can cause that. However, I, I do want to say that although depression is associated with fatigue, MS fatigue is not actually in research correlated with depression. So it, so it isn't something that just because you have fatigue, that means you're depressed. That is absolutely not true. Uh, but, however, if the depression is present, that is a very treatable thing and should be addressed. Uh, so with sleep dysfunction, that's one of my personal favorites. Uh, I think sleep is completely uh, <laughs> uh, devalued in our society. You know, before the invention of the light bulb, people were sleeping 10 hours a day, and that was considered normal. Now we're lucky, you know, it's like, well, if I could get away with four hours of sleep, I would. Uh, th th just wanting to pack so much. Also, you know, keeping ourselves awake so late in the night, watching television. The brain responds to light. We are meant to live night, day, night, day. And if I'm in a situation where I can't access the sun because I may be confined into my, you know, into my home or into other places, that can upset my regulation of my sleep cycles. So it will be important, uh, I think, to just focus on that because that, again, is a modifiable risk factor. It doesn't change all the other stuff that we just said, but that's something that people can impact if they know they're staying up too late, if they know they're trying to burn the candle at two ends. That would be a place that they could correct. What I've read about sleep and fatigue, and there have been studies done about whether or not MS fatigue is related to a lack of sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and what I understood from reading those studies was that um, not getting enough sleep can contribute to fatigue. Getting enough sleep doesn't necessarily cure fatigue. Is that? Yeah. Well, I think, I think that, that would be a good place to start. So are you getting enough sleep? Yes. Then is there something going on with sleep? I, I read a study about persons with spinal cord injury, transverse myelitis, and it showed that up to 25% of people with spinal cord injury are actually having a condition known as restless legs and periodic limb movements of the sleep that are actually impacting their sleep, and, 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 and they aren't aware of it. So that's not a conscious thing that's happening. So, so even if you think you're getting enough sleep, you could be having obstructive sleep apnea, you could be having restless legs, periodic limb movements in sleep. Those things occur because of brain issues, uh, narcolepsy, or other sleep disorders. So, so, those, so I think that uh, although I, I do want to say uh, that MS alone and, and, and pure sleep uh, could be there, but I want to also take away any other risk factor could, that could be going on. I can tell you, so then, are you snoring? When you wake up, are your bed clothes disheveled? Do you, does somebody say, you kick all night. Stop kicking me. I'm going to go sleep in the other room. Your snoring's too loud. If that's the case, and you know, otherwise, oh, no, you sleep like you're in a tomb. You know? so, 
So then, it, you know, so I think that those are just things that I want people to consider. Um, if those things are known, then move on, you know, then go on down the line. So the, the quality of the sleep that you have can be impaired even if you think you're getting enough sleep and even if you don't think that the quality of your sleep is impaired. One of the things that I've heard is that the number, that a, a certain percentage of people with MS have sleep disturbance, mm -hmm. period, that it, mm -hmm. it seems to be uh, not understood part of the disease, but it's pretty common in MS, is that your experience? Yeah, and that's, you know, there's, there can be impairment to the reticular activating system. That's a part of the brain. So the interesting thing about sleep is that there's not a, there's not a system that, that causes you to fall asleep or makes you unconscious. The consciousness actually has to recede. So that's a process. That's a structural portion of the brain called the reticular activating system. So, so, so I think that there can be cognitive behavioral. So if we're anxious, if we have other kinds of issues that can interrupt our sleep. Um, but I think that that is, uh, that, yes, absolutely. Um, and then also there are, so we can be taking medications for sleep, uh, but actually is that the type of restorative sleep that we would be wanting? So even if you think you're sleeping, you could be in stages one and two all night, never get into stage three and four because of pain. Every time you roll over, there's pain. And so then is that, can that be addressed? You know, neuropathic pain is another topic that I could spend a whole webinar on. It is so difficult to treat it when the pain originates in the very organ that produces sense. <laughs> However, uh, I think that more can be done uh, than is done, and I think everything should be tried until it's said, okay, this is as best we can do. So deconditioning can contribute to fatigue. Poor sleep can contribute to fatigue. What other things are secondary factors that contribute to fatigue? Well, we touched on pain. We touched on, uh, I think, spasticity. So I have patients who wake up in the middle of the night and their legs up by their chin, you know. Um, so can we treat that better? Uh, there is depression that I, that I talked about. Depression is not just treated with pills. It's also treated. Uh, I know, Pat, that you uh, understand that very well, that I think counseling uh, can go a long way with that. There is exercise that seems to be helpful in depression. Um, and then I think finally, we have to look at the medications that are given uh, to treat pain and uh, spasticity and understand that those things have side effects. So when I, you know, baclofen for, for one, uh, many people have to take baclofen during the day. The side effect is sedation. They feel tired during the day. So is there a certain level? So then I think the question that a person would want to ask themselves is what is the least amount of medication that I can use uh, to increase my function and not decrease my quality of life? And it may be that because the pain is so great, then they have to tolerate a certain level of sedation from the medications and that's the trade-off that they're willing to do. Um, but I think that that needs to come up when someone is suffering from fatigue. They have to think about it, uh, or I think about it when I'm seeing them in clinic. I'm thinking about it from a multifactorial area uh, because I know many people can just one med, then another med, and then another med, and another med, and then I'm giving them a med for fatigue that's trying to counteract all these other meds. And, and so then I like to just pierce, pierce through that, piece it apart, and say, how much do we need? Because it's a, like you said, it's a... It goes up and down. So somewhere you have a slide about how you think about um, treating fatigue. So when someone comes in to you, to you in clinic and they say, I'm really fatigued, how do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, so this is a really small slide, and I apologize for that. But I wanted to use it uh, just to illustrate when you're seeing your provider, the types of things, that, how they're thinking about it. Uh, because time is very limited when you're in that clinical appointment. And so I think in order to maximize the way that you can access your health care, it's really important to understand how your clinician is thinking. So this, so we think in algorithms, honestly. So is fatigue present, yes or no? If so, uh, let's look for modifiable factors like the medications that we're talking about. Also, assess for depression. Is it evident, yes or no? Treat that depression. If it's not, then keep going. So the question about depression and fatigue. Could you clarify that a little bit? Because I think one of the symptoms of depression can be fatigue, but mm -hmm. also um, depression, one of the symptoms of depression can be disturbed sleep, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if someone mm -hmm. has depression, mm -hmm. um, they may be fatigued, but they may also not be sleeping well, so which will also contribute to fatigue. So it's a, it's a kind of a complicated... Oh my gosh, so true. 
Uh, you know, and then uh, I would love it if everybody only drew one card uh, in life, and if it, they had to have the MS card, then that's the only card they have to draw. However, we also need to treat them and think of them as a human being that lives on the planet, okay? Mm -hmm. So that would be checking their labs. Do they have a thyroid deficiency? Yeah. Do they have anemia? Do they have, uh, you know, that's so common in women of childbearing age. Uh, they have heavy menses, and then they have anemia, and then something simple like, Iron replacement could be beneficial. So I, I like to think about uh, uh, people holistically trying to assess all the factors that can go into it. Okay. So when, when I ask, are you depressed, I'm not saying, oh, you're fatigued, therefore you're depressed. So I, I think that some people can get that message when a provider might ask them that, or they feel like, well, that's what they're saying, I'm depressed. I'm not depressed. You know, but understand that that's just one of the uh, 50 things, things that, you have to that I have through. to go through because I can't do anything about the you know neuroendocrine function you know so I'm so I guess you know I'm limited in how I can be helpful. So you're trying to find things that actually we can that we, we treat. can treat <laughs> yeah that we can make better yes because the in some ways and I think people don't understand this about treating fatigue they want to find one. Thing that will fix it and make it 85% better. And my experience is that you can find about 10 things and make each one of them about 5% better, <laughs> and then you get some improvement. Oh, that is, that is absolutely true. Uh, and, you know, I think all of us understand that there are areas in our life that we can probably improve, you know. And, and I, uh, so, so I don't want uh, there to be like this nihilistic, oh, well, I'm, you know, that's just the way it is, you know. Uh, obviously, accommodation to these things are important, um, uh, coming to terms with them. Um, but I think, you know, sometimes it's that just total denial that this is even happening. Uh, so where, so, uh, so that, that there, there are many factors. And so I think that having that conversation uh, with somebody who's understanding is important. Well, it's been my experience working with patients slowly these many years is that one of the big causes of fatigue is that people really don't want to have MS and so they try and pretend that they don't have it and they try and um, do things just the way they used to do them and mm -hmm. pack everything in the day that they used to pack into the day because mm -hmm. um, it doesn't make sense to them that they should be tired because they, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong and this is particularly true I think when people don't have more obvious symptoms of MS and more physical impairments, mm -hmm. that how this cannot possibly be this way, and I'm, it's just not going to be this way, I'm just going to not, I'm not, if I'm not going to give in to the disease, and so people don't take care of themselves in the way that they might, and they're really exhausted. Yeah. Uh, um, there's a, I think when someone is given a diagnosis like MS, it's something that happens to other people, you know. It's not something that happens to me. And it's not the life that I had maybe planned for myself. And I know that the whole process of identity can, can be into that. So what does that mean? Um, I can tell you some people raise the flag, they wave the flag, they wear the T-shirts, they got the keychain, right? But, but most people, I would say, I don't see them do that. I think most people, uh, I know people who um, their spouse knows and not their kids or maybe, you know, nobody knows, you know, and I think that, um, and then they try to keep up appearances, and um, I honor that, and, I, and, I, and I, I honor whatever experience people want to have with this, but I also know that that requires a lot of energy to do, and for anybody to keep up with the Joneses in the age of Pinterest and Facebook and all Instagram and all the lives, all the amazing lives that are happening out there, and I want to have an amazing life, and that's wonderful. And, you know, we have people that we can look to in, like, the Paralympics who have, they have achieved amazing things, and people do every day. I mean, I like to say, for many people, just washing the dishes, getting through their day, that's amazing. But, but it's almost like it's not enough, you know, and then they want to do more. And it's like, I'm going to go to Ikea, REI, Costco, all in one day, and then I'm going to throw a party. And I'm not going to use a scooter either. And I'm absolutely not going to use a scooter. You know, I can't be, you know. And I, just, and, I, and, I, and I guess I would say uh, to that person, it's okay. Whatever journey you're on right now is okay, but it's also okay if ever you wish to change that and move into some acceptance. It does involve some disintegration of the identity in order to reintegrate into an understanding that I am a person with MS. I'm not, I'm not an MS 
patient, right? I don't, I don't like that term. I, it, it's a person who has a mess. I'm a person who has mobility issues, you know, those things. Um, but I, it doesn't necessarily impact who they are as individuals. Each person has their own individual journey. So I, I don't think everyone needs to wave the flag or wear the T-shirt or those kinds of things. However, I, I, I do know that those who accept this diagnosis, who understand their limitations, who get to a point when they get to see uh, that they get to take care of themselves in a way that other people maybe don't, and that they have a they, they almost have an extra sense like when they start to tingle, they know it's time 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 for me to take a seat. It's time for me to sit down. You know, most people exhaust themselves. I was just at the Ectrums this last week, and I saw a poster that said stress can lead to hippocampal volume loss. So that's leading to possibly memory loss and these kinds of things. Now that's just anybody in the community. Everybody, I think, is living under this stressful life, you know, but I would hope that a person with MS could learn from the challenges that they've been given and their adaptability, and then I've seen people really transform into something quite beautiful. Well, so I think maybe we should spend some time talking about some concrete things like diet and so on and so forth, but before we do that, I do want to say that the adjustment and the things that you're talking about and people coming to terms with this, in my experience, is not something that happens overnight. It's, uh, it takes a while and uh, most people, I think, have to hit the wall at least once <laughs> before they decide that they can make some of these changes. Right. I, I agree with that, you know, and I, I like to say all the time, I'm, you know, I'm banging my head up against a door, because <laughs> sometimes all I have to do is just open that door, you know. Um, uh, so yeah, so I, I agree with that. Um, so when we talk about uh, different ways to manage fatigue, we mm -hmm. talk about energy conservation and looking how, at how you spend your energy uh, and those kinds of things. But what about things? People always ask about diet. Mm -hmm. um, does that make a difference in fatigue? You know, it does. I, I, I think anybody understands that after the Thanksgiving meal, you know, they want to go have a nap. Okay, so we know that diets that are really high in carbohydrates, which is a wonderful American diet, we love our carbs, that then there is just simply a response to that. The body is going to increase its insulin, it's going to increase uh, the, the need to the autonomic response, which is to now digest, so rest and digest. So then the body is going to want to do that. You also have circadian rhythm. So at 3 o'clock, uh, in some cultures, they have a siesta. Uh, listen to those things. Um, you know, I know I don't have the best diet. I think we can all make improvements. I mean, what did you have for breakfast, Pat? I don't want to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to talk about it. But cinnamon and sugar was involved. Uh-huh. And I had two bowls of Rice Krispies. So, you know, I think we can all uh, think of areas in our life that we could make improvements. So if I could have a protein-based meal that has some, if I could have an omelet with some, um, you know, vegetables in it, would that make me feel better? Probably. And I could experiment with that if that was something that I could focus on. And, you know, I would advise people take one thing at a time. Don't try to change everything at once. You know, don't work on your sleep and your exercise and your diet all in once. This is a lifelong process, so I don't want it to overwhelm anyone. You know, I'm just saying, could there be things that I could do today that could change how I feel? Yes. Try to decrease sugar. Try to decrease, you know, that junk food and all that stuff. Um, uh, caffeine, which is, I think, probably the most used anti-fatigue uh, medication or chemical out there, uh, but there's a drop-off from that, and if it's causing insomnia at night, then maybe that's not the best thing, or maybe there's a time to cut it. So those would be things in the diet that we can change. So if I'm drinking Coca-Cola just to get through my day, or energy drinks, oh my gosh, I can't tell you how many people I have coming into the clinic with their Red Bulls, you know, um, and, uh, but I think that there's an impact, you know. Are we driving ourselves too hard um, and using these things to try to get things maybe extra, or are we just trying to get through the day? You know, and, and, and if that's all it is, that's fine, but that would be an area, I think. Um, and we talked about lifestyle, so exercise. So we know that, you know, 90 minutes of aerobic exercise could be very helpful. 90 minutes per week, so that's not even per day. So that's, you know, that's seven days a week. That's, you know, if you, do, if you could do 15 minutes a day, you'd be over that. Uh, so I think in Colorado, with the Olympic training camp in Colorado Springs and just the, the energy here uh, that they, they, everybody thinks they have to do a marathon. No, no, just put on your shoes, take a walk around, try to get into an aerobic heart rate. It's not the Jane Fonda, 
you know, I'm I'm that old. I have to do that reference. <laughs> uh, I don't, uh, it's, you know. But but I think that it is just kind of doing those simple things and then being consistent. Only 10% of the entire U.S. population is exercising on a consistent basis. If you add fatigue, mobility issues to that, I mean, that that that's very very challenging. But I but I have to because science supports encourage people to exercise. So. It's what you do most of the time that counts, mm -hmm. not what you do occasionally. So people are better off, I always feel compelled to say this, to do something for 10 minutes a day mm -hmm. and feel okay about that, even though a lot of the things that you read tell you that that's not enough or not good enough. In my opinion, comma, that's a good place to start, mm -hmm. and that's good enough. Oh, you're, you're so right, Pat. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that is enough. Put I mean, on your shoes and show up. Mm -hmm. Show up. And some days you're not going to feel like it. And if you're in bed three days after doing what you just did, you did too much. So maybe for you it's five minutes. And you can feel okay about that because that's where you are. But I can guarantee to you that we know that there are there's decreased mitochondrial function. These are the powerhouses within our cells that we can increase that through exercise. It gradually increasing it, it does over time. Not, yeah, not the weekend warrior. And if it, if you, you will know, if you can exercise to the point to where when you're done, you could say, I could do that again. And that's probably a good place to start. And then you will, over time, incrementally increase that. You will just simply walk faster. Okay. So before we finish this part of our program, mm -hmm. I think we do need to address the issue of medications to treat fatigue because sometimes that isn't where you, uh, I don't think that's where you want to start, mm -hmm. but sometimes that's a place where you have to go. So what about using medications to treat fatigue? Do they work? What are they? How, how appropriately do you use them? Right. Well, so yes, there are uh, medications that are, uh, we actually have one FDA approved treatment uh, for, to, for, to treat MS fatigue. It's not used as much, I think. Um, let me get over to that slide. So when we're talking about, so let's get right into the pharmaceutical treatment. So amantadine is a medication that is, was developed as a flu, uh, anti-flu medication. Uh, but we know that it has effects on the uh, dop dopaminergic pathways as well as effects on the uh, glutamate receptors in the brain, okay? So what that means is that that can help to increase the kind of excitability, electrical impulses in the brain and can help people to feel better and more uh, less fatigued. And by the way, it's not a controlled substance. So anybody would prescribe this to you and they wouldn't have any issues. It's FDA approved, it's, it's generic, it's very cheap. Um, there have been some studies that have looked at provigil, new vigil. These are uh, dual uh, neuroadrenergic, so this is increasing the excitability or the adrenergic or the uh, you know adrenaline type features and uh, the dopaminergic uh, production inside the brain. So, uh, but these are these are uh, in these are not these are incomplete. Okay, so what people will say is that yeah, it's helpful. Uh, you know, Adderall, Ritalin, these are given for the, I, I find actually Adderall and Ritalin to help more with the cognitive effects of MS, you know, so that, so that when people are getting attention, I think that, that people can have ADD as a consequence of MS and they can find it's very difficult for me to focus on a task for a long period of time. That can increase their concentration, but I do not find that it helps them with their exercise fatigue or it helps them with these other areas mm. of fatigue. Um, Does, but, and provigil is the same, it helps with the cognitive stuff more than Well, the research has shown that the, the, the provigil and vigil can help. Um, the Adderall has not, they, it's been very mixed, so it's been more helpful with the cognitive fatigue, uh, whereas the provigil and vigil seems to be more with just the overall fatigue. Mm -hmm. But even still, I would say many people have tried all of these and are still suffering, you know. So I don't think that this is the answer. If you're not on it, you know, to get on it and think this is going to be the answer, I think that you will be disappointed, and it's, I think it's only a partial answer. Um, Ampira, I, I, I think this drug is so interesting because it actually stops the leaking of these potassium uh, electrolytes, and it helps to just contain it a little more so that the as that uh, action potential or that electricity is jumping over that gap of myelin, it kind of increases the excitability of that, and so then people feel a little more spring to their step. It's the walking drug. Uh, but it's been shown in optic neuritis to help with vision. It's been shown, uh, my patients will tell you, that it helps with their cognition. It helps them to just feel like they can do more. And so, but the problem is it only works about 30% of patients. So 70% of people who take that drug aren't going to find that effect. 
So it's important to whatever drug that you find that you're not just going for a placebo effect, that you're hoping that it's going to work and it doesn't work. So we really got to measure the outcome of treatment. So to wrap up about pharmaceutical treatments, are these drugs that you have to take regularly? Can you take them um, as needed? How do they work? Yeah, I think, so Empira does build up in the system, and so that is something that you would want to take on a regular basis. Amantadine, I think the same way. With the pro and new I have lots of people who just simply take it if they know they have to go to a wedding or they know that they're going to be, you know, out for all day, and then they cannot take it. They don't, you don't have to take this. These are things that I think can be, you could take it during the week and not on the weekends, or take it on the weekends and not during the week. You know? So amantadine you need to take regularly in order to get the effect. I think With so, yeah. With Empira, can you tell in a, a period of time if it's going to be helpful yes. for you? Yes. yes, you can. It should be within, a, within that first month, you should see the impact. And if you don't, it's probably worth a while to maybe come off of it and try it off, and then notice if you see the reverse difference. And then maybe there was a difference, you just weren't noticing it. So I think it's, it's reasonable to try it, and then try without it, oh. and then try it again, you know, um, and see if it can be helpful, because it's really the only thing we have as far as to help improve walking. So amantadine and Ampera only work for about half the people right. who try it? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't know that I can explain why that is. I just think that that's, that's just what we have seen. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, as far as sleep. So we have a lot of questions here for sleep. So for people that are taking sleeping medications, here's Andy talking about, you know, I use lorazepam. It's beneficial. So, so lorazepam in particular is a very short-acting benzodiazepine. And what can happen is that you are, it's a very broad base, it's suppressing the nervous system, the central nervous system depressant, okay? So it's just a very broad uh, dampening of electrical excitability. So it helps with sleep and it does put people to sleep. It's also anti-anxiolytic, so if anxiety or just that racing mind is causing you. But it's really only to be used as needed. One is habituation, so people will get tolerance to it, so it won't work as well over time. Two, alcohol is a very nice, sleep aid, uh, unfortunately what will happen is there's a rebound. And the same thing can occur with lorazepam. Um, I think uh, if you're using a benzodiazepine, and that's that class of like Valium, Clonopin, or Clonazepam, anything that ends in a PAM, okay, then those ones, uh, they're short acting and there's long acting. So, so, and it's also a very old medication, and there's a lot of hangover effects. So sometimes people will say, you know, I wake up and I'm still like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, it takes me a while to get up. Um, and that's why uh, people develop these hypnotics, like Ambien and these kinds of things. Uh, but people who have, as a woman, uh, like my 120-pound woman, is taking the man-sized dose of Ambien, and then uh, what's happening is people are sleep driving, you know, <laughs> or they're sleep eating, or they're kind of doing these things. It's only shutting down one portion of the brain. So uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is another way that people can train their brain to learn how to fall asleep, and it's been shown to be very helpful. So I think of sleep aids as kind of a last ditch. There's also Rosarim, which is a sleep aid that actually upregulates the melatonin receptors in the brain so that people can fall asleep more naturally. And, and, and it would be my advice that, that those should be the things that people want to try first, uh, especially if they're having that racing mind. Um, to try to help to promote those naturally. Melatonin can be really helpful as well. I know Dr. Vollmer likes to use diphenhydramine, uh, which is Benadryl. Uh, so those kinds of things I think are safe uh, to use. Uh, but I think that when you're t looking at benzos, especially short acting, you have that rebound. So then people can say, I'm waking up at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm wide awake. And so then that's because the central nervous system has been depressed, and what does it want to do? It wants to rebound up as that drug wears off, and so then now they're wide awake and then they maybe have to take another one, uh, right? And so then, and they're only going to increase their tolerance. So, so, but I, but I, again, I use it. I mean, I don't use it personally. <laughs> I use it in, uh, in clinic, and I think that it can be helpful, but more on the intermittent use. Medications should be tried to be, in general, used in the intermittent use. Obviously, there are refractory cases where people just simply cannot sleep, and their insomnia is so profound. And I get that. It's a form of torture in some countries, you know, <laughs> to not be able to sleep. And so, uh, you know, the fear of not sleeping, I think, is, is very real as well. But um, so I'm not saying never, ever. I'm just saying in general. Uh, so, yeah, so there's also a question about MS and sleep apnea. So uh, actually one out of four persons, so it, it occurs more in men. It occurs more in men who have uh, increased 
a BMI or a neck size, so if you think about the collar on a shirt, uh, those, those increase the risk factor. But it is seen in women, especially in postmenopausal women, uh, that there's an increased risk. Now, I've seen an MS, but it's rare. I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't know all the data on that, but there is this kind of a central sleep apnea that comes out of the brain. I would think that that would occur in more advanced disease. Um, I would say that probably the risk factors for sleep apnea, now again, for, just for terminology, this is when people stop breathing, either partially or fully for periods between, you know, 10 to 60 seconds, and then they wake up because now their oxygen is dropped and it's caused their brain to want to wake up. Uh, so that, like I said, there is an increased risk factors for PMA, uh, for, uh, sorry, periodic limb movements in sleep, but the OSA or sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, I'm not sure, I would have to look at that. Uh, but I think it's a reasonable thing to question if you're having any snoring or anyone's telling you that you're not breathing at night. Um, okay, so we talked about the pharmaceutical. I do want to just show this little slide here. You know, so some people, they're telling me, I'm so tired, I'm so tired, and then they go to bed and they're wide awake. You know, it's so frustrating. Um, and, and so I, I think, you know, I totally get that. It is, it is a challenge. It is something that I think, um, you know, that I'm aware of. Uh, but I, I, I do think that, um, that this just occurs, and it's because there's different mechanisms going on here. Do you hear patients report that they are really fatigued during the day, and then they get a second wind long about, oh, I don't know, uh, 6, 7 o'clock, and then, then they have energy in the evening? Yeah, I do. I do hear that, um, and I capitalize on that. <laughs> Um, so if you ask, so what are you doing? You know, so sometimes, so what we have seen with fatigue is that when people rest, I, I really encourage people to take the nap, take the nap, not the two-hour nap, but the 40-minute nap. If you can somehow just take 20 to 40 minutes at the middle of your day at that natural circadian lull, right around 3 o'clock if you're waking up at the same time every day, then you're, uh, then you will, you will get that extra. So you know uh, that you're you're capitalizing on kind of these normal human mechanisms to try to increase your function. Uh, so so, but even in people who push through their day, they can get that kind of second win. And I and I I think that that is good. Also, I think that people can push past their normal bedtime, and then they can't go back to sleep because you have to understand the body is a rhythmic, uh, it's a rhythmic. Um, uh, organism. So we are on the rhythms. We don't think of ourselves as being uh, on the natural rhythms, uh, but we are affected by light, by sound. And so then if, if we can get into tune with the way that our body is, then we can start to listen to it. And when the body is saying, go to bed, go to bed. You know, or if it's, and if it's saying, you know, maybe it's time for a nap, have a nap. You know, don't push through those things. Don't power it with the coffee. Uh, you know, uh, or, or do that. If that's what you want to do, I mean, we're all big. We're 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 all, you know, I'm a big girl. I'm I'm an adult, and I get to know. But I but the purpose of this webinar is to is so that you know, so that you understand, so that you so that now you have the knowledge. And sometimes that knowledge leads to decisions. But sometimes I, my decision is I'm going to choose to do. I'm going to stay up all night, and I like to watch my internet. And I, you know, once the kids go to bed, that's my time, right? I mean, and that's that's okay. So I I just uh, there's not a perfect way to do this. Everybody has their own experience, and I, and I, and I validate that. Uh, but th these are tools that you can use, and you can pick up or put down as you see fit. Yeah, I frequently say to people, it's really okay if you want to blow it out and you know, spend all of your energy mm -hmm. on one thing. Mm -hmm. Just know that you may have to pay for it for the next couple of days, but if you can afford to pay for it for the next couple of days, mm -hmm. then do whatever you want. Yeah, Pat, that's a great way to think about it. It's like an account. You only have so much in that account, so how do you want to spend it? So if, you, if, 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 if you're spending it on things that you really don't want to be, then, then think about it as a limited resource. Your energy and your time is limited. So how best do you wish to use that time and energy and to put it towards the things that are really important to you, to be very intentional about that. And that goes back into that energy conservation, pacing strategies, work simplification. You know, if you're spending a lot of time cleaning your house and you could afford or there's somebody who's offering to clean your house, let them, let them do it, you know, spend your time and energy on the things that are important to you. Um, so then those would just be things that I would want people to think about. Yeah, personally I have found that you can live with a dirtier bathroom than my mother would have thought you could live with. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another way to make that change if you can't afford and nobody's offering. Uh -huh. 
Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Just let it be a little bit dirty right? than you thought. Yeah. They say at the end of life, you don't think, gosh, I should have done more dishes. I should have just had all those dishes done. Yeah, you don't think that, you know. No, I will never think that. It will not happen to me. No. <laughs> Uh, so let's spend some time here just on some questions that we might have. Some folks wrote in a little earlier uh, to just let us know the types of things that they would be uh, asking us. So um, there is this question about secondary progressive MS um, and talking, I understand that the problem at this stage is degeneration instead of inflammation, but why exactly is my fatigue so much worse? Can I expect that to continue and worsen? So what I can tell you is that in secondary progressive MS that all the research has shown uh, that, it, that fatigue does seem to worsen when compared to relapsing remitting MS. And that has also been associated with age and the male gender. Um, it's, it's associated with increased problems of mobility and it's not correlated with depression. So we know that persons with secondary progressive MS are more fatigued in general uh, when we research them. Uh, and as far as why, I think it again talks about this kind of immune and central nervous system dysregulation and that there may be underlying mechanisms in the neurodegenerative phase that are, that are underlying these things, although you may be told that your MRI is remaining the same, um, which would be why it's still important. You know, here at the, at the Anschutz um, Medical Center, we don't classify you know, strictly into secondary progressive, relapsing, remitting, primary progressive, we say you have MS and that the treatment should fit what's going on with you clinically. It's very important that, uh, that we are proactive because even though that brain MRI may be looking good, if, if the person is changing, we want to make sure that that person is on maximal therapy. If they are still within that realm of uh, potentially having disease progression, there's nothing that says that somebody shouldn't be. You know, for the past 20 years, we were told that we shouldn't be treating primary progressive. I, we just feel that that's completely unethical, uh, that, that we do see that people with primary progressive disease, we can't cure, but we do slow down that progression. And so then that, I don't think we should ever give up on that hope uh, that we would be able to slow or arrest or put into remission uh, these categories uh, that have been created. That they are very clinical categories. It's just what we, we what we've seen or observed. But there are things that are underlying in the brain um, as far as brain reserve and volume in the brain that we are now starting to understand. That I think also explain uh, what what this person is experiencing. So I think we have just a few seconds maybe left. So can we summarize what it is that we have said today? So it sounds like what you're saying is that there are different causes of fatigue. Some of them have to do with the disease, and one of the most important ways to treat those causes of fatigue is to effectively treat the disease. So the more effectively you treat disease progression, the more effectively you're going to treat Fatigue. Right. Worsening fatigue. Worsening fatigue. Yeah. So we, we, we don't have a way to take back time. We, we have to be proactive in this disease. We are trying to get the message out into the general community that this is a progressive uh, disease that takes from folks, that takes away their quality. So we are very, um, we're very passionate about being proactive in persons with MS and to get them on highly effective therapies early. Uh, that is not the general consensus. You know, when I go to conferences, I am shocked uh, by the way uh, this escalation therapy is going along, and that fatigue is something that they are hearing in the clinic, but they're not responding to. They're not responding to by escalating that therapy. Uh, you know, for us, uh, sometimes by the time the person has access to uh, the better therapies that are available on planet Earth today, uh, so much central nervous system damage has already taken place, and that just breaks my heart because I know that when I have an 18-year-old and I have her on Tysabri, which just sounds crazy to a lot of clinicians, I can tell you. Like, why would you put her at risk for this brain infection and everything? It's because I'm very good at what I do. I mean, I don't mean to toot my own horn, but when you go to an MS center, we understand these drugs. I know exactly what it does. I know exactly how to help her, how to take care of her. And then when she comes back, when she's 24 and ready to start having kids, and she says, you know, do I still have MS? She hasn't relapsed. She had terrible relapses, and now she's asking me if she still has MS. That, to me, is hope. That, to me, is that's the music to my ears, and that's the hope for the next generation, you know. 
And, and every year, like this year, we have really exciting therapies that are coming out that we're really looking forward to. Every year, we want the cure. We want the cure. We want to continue the research and the work that's going on so that we can help to prevent these things from ever happening because right now the brain is just too complicated even for the smartest people with their full-time jobs. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Rocky Mountain MS Center. Thank you uh, out there listening. Um, I just really appreciate your time. I just hope that you've gotten something out of this. I, I honor your experience and I really hope uh, I look forward to seeing you. If you see me in clinic, hi there, thanks so much, uh, and I'll see you soon. Goodbye. Thank Th you for joining us. Thanks, Pat. And thank you, Anastasia Wall and Patricia Daly, for presenting for us today. I just want to reiterate again, if uh, you missed something during the presentation today, or if you're interested in the uh, webinar on exercise by Dr. Hebert, these are all archived on the MS Center website, which is www.mscenter.org under the Education tab. Thank you.